Today, we're going to be talking about the white marble of ancient Rome, but of course, so much of that white marble, the statuary was painted. Here's uh, a replica of the famous Augustus Prima Porta that is showing you how much of the statue was originally painted. A lot of the paint from the ancient world is going to be uh, lost uh, over time when these statues, when these monuments are buried. But we're going to be talking about that color in the context of the white marbles of ancient Rome. First of all, what the Romans were using before marble, then in comes marble with conquest, really not in a grand scale until the second century BC. Then we'll be talking about what really picks up pace in the end of the first century BC and into the imperial period. We'll be looking at Italian marble, Carrara, and then we'll be looking at uh, other marbles predominantly coming from uh, the Greek East. All right, so before you have marble, you're going to use the local volcanic conglomerates, these tuffs that we've talked about on many occasions. You have the original wall circuit made of tuff blocks. Uh, first, they're quarried extremely locally, really from the hills of Rome themselves. And then over time, they're going to go further afield towards the Alban Hills, and they're going to be identifying and extracting better qualities of volcanic stone. Now, we see them principally like this, and you see in the photo, the cornice, uh, the free zone, those are blocks of tuff that are compact enough that they can take detail. You'll even see examples of statuary, but they're poorly, uh, the archaeological record for them is poorly preserved. We have to go to Montemartini to see some examples of that. But the stuff that we call pepperino comes from either the Alban Hills or nearby in Gavii. But they're going to be superseded by better materials, materials that are going to be more compact. So this metamorphosed uh, limestone, it's a metamorphic rock composed of recrystallized carbonate minerals. This is what we, how we define marble today. Of course, um, you know, we're going to see other, other stones that the Romans are going to be employing, particularly when we talk about uh, colored marbles, we'll be including uh, the granites that are coming from Egypt. But when we're talking about marble, uh, we're talking about something that has um, less tensile strength than bronze. So you're going to have all kinds of supports around uh, extended appendages. And of course, at the base, uh, this stuff can just snap off if the, you know, the, the statue is big enough on the top. So um, it's not as strong as bronze. It will need some extra supports. It is something that is difficult to maneuver, to ship, to work with. It's almost three tons per cubic meter. We have to always keep that in mind as well. And then ultimately how we're going to be identifying the various white marbles. There are certain characteristics that you can just eyeball to have a pretty good sense of it's probably this or it's probably that or it's definitely not this. But the scientific uh, analysis has able, enabled us to have a much clearer picture of uh, the origins of the white marbles. So you're using trace elements, ESR spectroscopy, thermoluminescence, and stable isotopic ratios. And uh, there are a number of scholars around the world involved in this. And it means identifying the ancient quarries and getting samples for which there could be a great variety within a given quarry, and then going and getting permission to take small samples from the backsides of various reliefs, um, architectural features, and statues to then uh, match those signatures. And there's been great progress done in the past 20 years. Here we see an example of two different marbles employed. This is the famous Pontifex Maximus statue. It's in Palazzo Massimo, for which we have done a video for Museo Nazionale Romano. You can go check out this statue in that video, always on our YouTube channel. Now, the body is made of Carrara or uh, Italic marble. 
which is going to be quarried by Julius Caesar and Augustus, really not much beforehand. But then the specific uh, designation of the stone for the portrait, which is uh, arguably the most important part of this statue, they choose to use a more uh, appreciated, more famous, um, let's say, better quality, less imperfections. It's the Parian marble which is known and used and exploited by the Greeks from the 6th century BC. The Romans are obviously then in this statue, making a distinction of two different kinds of white marbles. Okay, now the first temple in Rome goes back to 146 BCE, not before. What are they making temples with before? They're using tuff, they're using terracotta plaques. Uh, and there's infrequently the use of marble, but initially, throughout most of the Republic, they're going to be just small choice pieces that are used for some statuary, some architectural feature, maybe just the head of a statue, a cult statue. Now, that's all going to change with so much material coming in, this market, this demand for uh, the marble, and in comes not just the marble, but the sculptor, the designer of that first uh, Greek uh, material statue and, and temple, the Jupiter Stator Temple in the Portico of Metellus in the Circus Flaminius. We don't have that anymore, although we know the location. What we do have is something literally one generation away. So at the end of the second century BC, we have this temple, and it's the round temple in the Forum Boarium, the cattle market, and the stat and the, um, the marble here used is pentelic marble, which is the marble made famous by the Athenians. It comes from Mentele Pentelicon just outside of Athens. So things start off on a small scale when they finally do have marble arriving. And in fact, one of the famous characteristics of this particular uh, temple is when we look at the columns, the column capitals were actually made of two separate blocks. And that's an indication, it, here's the suggestion, the indication in the scholarship is that's unusual. You don't normally make a capital out of two separate blocks. It suggests then that the amount and the size of the blocks that are coming into Rome initially are not that great. So here's a solution we'll just take two of the smaller blocks available to us, pin them together, and then carve the capital. Now, keep in mind also, when we talk about the white marbles, statuary was painted. Now, the paint was applied and over time reapplied. Why are they doing this? You're giving more details. You're informing the viewer more about that figure, mythological or real. Think about hair color. Think about the color of the eyes. Um, Think about the color of the skin. Uh, you're giving details, character, drama, emotion. Think about conveying more the um, the uh, maybe hair on the body. If it's, a, if it's a cyclops, you want that hair on the feet and the chest and the arms to stand out. Um, maybe it's because uh, you want to convey or show more the particular kind of clothing that they're wearing, which would then be distinguished from the, from the flesh. Okay, oftentimes I use encaustic painting technique, melted beeswax and paint is then applied over the surface of the marble and it has then a sort of translucent quality so you'll still be able to see uh, the, the actual surface of the marble itself. Where's the color coming from? Red is from cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide. A brownish color is from an ochre, which is just a clay earth pigment. Black can be attained in many different ways, including burning ivory. Uh, murex shells can uh, be used to squash the little sea snails to get the purple dye. Um, blue comes from calcium copper silicate. White comes from uh, white lead. Now, um, and then you're going to be applying these to the surfaces of the statues. Now, when they're buried for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, when you're uncovering them, most of that paint, it's biodegradable, is going to be lost. Or when it's exposed to the air after thousands of years, it eventually fades. 
So for example, when we go back to that Augustus Prima Porta statue from the beginning, the reason why we have a pretty good idea of what it looked like was that when it, when it was unearthed in the 1860s, a lot of the paint was still actually quite visible and it was documented. So what happens though is as we're um, unearthing these statues over the centuries through, let's say in particular, the Renaissance times, there is a kind of a development of this aesthetic of appreciating the statues as they are, which by and large was not too much paint. And when we get forward into the time of Winkelmann, who is considered to be the 18th century father of art history, he's really pushing this aesthetic. So over time, we're also understanding that at times the color, if it's still there, is actually forcibly removed by those early collectors and so forth. Today, how do we understand if there, unless it's visible like this painting here from Monte, this uh, statue from Ponte Martini, how do we know that there was color on it? We can use ultraviolet light, but we can use microscopic analysis of the traces that are still identifiable on the surface of the uh, statue. We can use X-ray spectroscopy. And of course, when we look at mosaics, when we look at paintings like this one from, uh, you know, from Pompeii, when we look at the fam mummy portraits using encaustic uh, painting on wood, and we're seeing the tones, the shades, the color of the hair and so forth, we're understanding that yes, indeed, color, that's what the Romans saw in. They weren't looking at their artwork in black and white. They weren't looking at their statues uh, as white statues, but they were distinguishing them with all kinds of color highlights. You also painted the letters nine times out of 10 for the inscriptions, again, to better highlight the letter forms because all, as you can see, the letters are all kind of squashed together. So you want to heighten the uh, legibility as much as possible. Now here's an example of a hall in the Forum of Augustus where you actually have the traces of painting on the panels of white marble. So we don't have a ton of examples to refer to like this, but there are indeed quite a few that exist throughout the Mediterranean. Okay, here's another famous example from Monte Martini. Uh, uh, the, um, this is attributed to the uh, garden estates of a Caligula and a close up here shows us that they're using all kinds of paints uh, to apply to statuary. You can see how the eye has been painted, but you can also see gold that has been apl applied to the surface of the skin. Here we have a portrait in the uh, Museum of Athens, the National Museum of Athens, and we have a lot of the beard still uh, painted. And then there would have been highlighted further by the insertion of probably glass paste for the eyes. So when we do go around and we do take a look at architectural features, friezes, when we're taking a look at statuary, we want to then be well aware that those features by and large were originally painted. And sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's quite obvious here. We have the um, dying Gaul and uh, the image on the right, I guess maybe beneath my screen, uh, what you actually see is the uh, mortal wound applied to the surface of the skin of this, uh, of this man and the drops of blood that are forming on the surface of the skin. How much more that would have been highlighted with the uh, application of paint. So where is the white marble coming from? So you have on the one hand in Italy, the famous Carrara marble, the Italic marble, but everything else is coming from, uh, well, you can see here from what we call Greece today, that's Mount Pentelicon right by uh, Athens, and everything else is coming from the islands in between Greece and Turkey, as well as mainland Turkey. These are all important Greek city-states with um, you know, very important quarries that are going to be exploited. 
Some already exist as early as the sixth century BC. Other ones are going to be really exploited only under Augustus and subsequent uh, emperors. But you can see right here in terms of the white marble extraction, it's predominantly coming from the east, but also predominantly uh, these quarry sites are islands. So you extract the stone and pop it on a ship and off you go to Rome. The major difficulty, the major costs, like for Dukimian marble that we'll talk about shortly, is when they're at a land route, uh, your, your, your cost is ex extraordinarily high because transporting by land is much more expensive, tedious, and time consuming than shipping by sea. So here we have our famous uh, Carrara marble. Sure, the Etruscans are documented as having uh, extracted some, but really not so familiar to the Romans into the second century BCE. And then of course, as Julius Caesar begins to exploit it for his building project, particularly his first uh, forum of Caesar. And then on a large scale, it comes in under Augustus. Uh, and again, it's that forum of Augustus that's really having quite a substantial supply, the first big use of Carrara marble. And it's coming from a great distance from Rome 350 kilometers, but hey, most of that route you can do by sea. The difficulty is extracting it from the top of a mountain and then carefully controlling the, uh, the, the path down off the mountain to um, the, uh, the port city, uh, Luni, to then bring it all the way to Rome. So here we get a little view past the later Forum Transitorum. We're going to pivot over to the Forum of Augustus, and we want to think about predominantly here for the columns and so forth and the staircase, uh, it's Carrara marble. It's the marble of Italy. What a great statement then for Augustus as he's employing it on a grand scale as never before uh, seen in Rome at the time. And the white marbles in Imperial Rome, let's look at Parian marble already being quarried heavily by the Greeks. It's an island uh, and uh, it has a, it's known for just this incredible translucent quality. Number one statuary uh, marble for the Greeks. Pentelic marble has a lot of inclusions, mica quartz and so forth. So not as prestigious you can say, but of course used for very many projects, including the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. So Chimian marble, Aphrodisian marble, uh, they're both really going to be heavily exploited only from Augustus and onward. And it's to Chimian that's really, really expensive because it's inland in central Turkey, in Phrygia, and there is no easy way. There's no river connecting to the sea. It's a big, expensive land route. So when you saw Dukimia marble in Rome, you knew it had a big price tag. Aphrodisia marble is closer to the coast. Uh, it's uh, Gulf Tepe, and that is uh, these quarries actually, in recent times, we really understand how heavily this was being used in particular, the Sperlonga um, statuary coming in, either Augustan or Tiberian in date. Uh, fantastic. Uh, you can see my video on it on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Darius Arya. And, uh, you know, more and more, uh, first and second centuries, this is becoming a predominant statuary type. And with these new studies, more sophisticated studies on the marbles, it's turning out that a lot of things that like when I went to school, we were told was the Carrara marble is now turning out to be Dukimia marble, such as the famous Calminus statue, Calminus as Hercules in the Capitoline Museums. So we are getting a more refined understanding and, and view of the various kinds of marbles and how they're picking up and, and, and becoming more popular under certain emperors over others. Athassos is an island, uh, Proconesus is an island, uh, and so obviously you get a lot of these uh, shipments coming from an island on a boat and then off to Rome. So you can imagine then that's going to keep the costs down. Uh, Proconesian in particular is going to be very popular in the second century and onward. We can see it for the columns, for example, for the temple of Hadrian, the god, just down the street from the, um, from the Pantheon. And it has a very distinct kind of uh, regular gray banding that goes uh, through it. So that's one you can feel pretty confident when you look at when you're trying to eyeball it. And it's going to be used all the way forward 
uh, into the fourth and fifth centuries uh, CE. A pentalic marble is particularly uh, popular with the Flavians. And here we're taking a look at the uh, magnificent arch of Titus. The inner arch is what's original. The outer part is made of travertine stone. That's going to be with the restoration job in the early 19th century. And we also want to keep in mind that throughout this discussion today, of all these white marbles, the true white stone of ancient Rome was actually travertine stone, a limestone quarried from Tivoli, ancient Tibur. And it was uh, in use really from about 200 BC and onward. And the sheer amount of volume of travertine stone that comes into the city of Rome throughout antiquity far outweighs the amount of marble that came into the city. But you really won't see travertine stone as statuary um, building material. It rather is for grand public structures like the uh, Stadium of Domitian and the Colosseum. <laughs> 